Hello, my darlings. Mother Raven here with Chapter 4 of Silver Ticket by William Schoen. The room was dark, and a picture of what looked to be a military base on the moon was being projected onto a white screen. The audience wasn't very big, either. There must have been 50 chairs in the room, but there were only 20 people. To me, it seemed kind of awkward being there as the announcer tried his best to figure out where he was in his lecture due to the fact that we interrupted him. When he got himself situated, he continued his speech. He spoke about the future. He told us that humanity would colonize the galaxy. He spoke about the shape that Earth would be in due to long-term pollution and global warming. This lecture was quite interesting until things turned a bit controversial. The speaker pointed his remote control at the projector and a picture of some kind of code on the screen. It read E O T 109. What is that? I asked the speaker. This friend is the end of time, he announced. The crowd grew eager with oohs and ahs. I smiled with anticipation, wondering what the end of everything could potentially hold. When he pointed the remote and changed the slide, there was no picture, just a long paragraph. I was disappointed because I thought he would have shown us something. There are many theories on what happened on the end of days, he read. Many religions have their predictions. There's Ragnarok. Armageddon, and many others. Scientists have predicted scenarios such as the Big Rip, the Big Crunch, and... Scientists are wrong, a voice shouted. I looked to my right and saw an angry man standing up in the middle of the audience. His red face was illuminated by the projection's light as he yelled at the speaker. People, this man has been speaking nothing but lies, and I won't stand for it. God created the universe, not an explosion, and God will not end it in any way you just mentioned. The man went on and on about how all of us need to be saved and how science was made to brainwash us by Lucifer. The audience proceeded to boo him and yell insults and curse words at the man until Matt jumped out of his chair and ran over to the crazy Christian. He then grabbed him by his shirt collar and put him in a headlock. I watched as Matt dragged the disruptor out of the townhouse and slammed the door. We get way too many of those assholes, Matt sighed. Don't remind me, the announcer scoffed. I don't get it. Why do these preachers come to non-religious events to try and convert people, Deborah asked. Religion has been forced on people for eons. It doesn't have to make sense. This is just freaking fedged up. Mr. Hurst and Matt snorted. Language, Matt, the announcer snapped. Whatever. On with the lecture so we can get to the refreshments. I'm starving. Mr. Hurston continued his lecture about the end of time. He explained the various theories made by scientists over decades. This ended up being a real turnoff from the subject because I got the realization that I shouldn't care how everything will end because I will more than likely never live to see it. When the lecture was over, the lights were turned on and Matt and Deborah brought out tables of food and drinks for everyone to enjoy. I hadn't eaten since that morning, so I was pretty hungry. There were hot dogs, hamburgers, donuts, barbecue sandwiches, as well as chocolate chip cookies and a few different flavors of ice cream. I made my way to the food tables with a hungry smile on my face. I grabbed a plate and got two hamburgers and four hot dogs. Then I sat down back in the audience chairs with my food and started eating. So are you excited for the trip tomorrow? Asked Matt. It's tomorrow? I said surprised. Yeah, this is the last meeting. This is also the up all night party. We're going to stay up and play video games and watch science fiction films. So the last meeting always has a party afterwards? I asked. Yeah, man, he confirmed. Are you staying? I can't. My aunt has me on a strict curfew since I'm staying with her this summer. That's a bummer, Matt complained. My dad is on his honeymoon with my stepmom for the summer, so he has me staying with my crazy old Aunt Vicky. 
I told him about what had been going on with Aunt Vicky lately. Matt seemed pretty concerned with the fact that I was staying in the house with a schizophrenic patient who is a heavy drinker and sometimes doesn't take her medication. I told him that I would be all right and that my dad wouldn't risk my life over a honeymoon. As much as I wanted to believe that, I couldn't. I could see that my dad developed this fear that just because I was a teenager, I would be into drinking, drugs, sex, and parties. He was obviously paying more attention to statistics than my overall personality. From the time leading up to the stay with Aunt Vicky, certain rules were being laid down. He stopped allowing me to have my female friends in my room with my door closed. I had to be home before it gets dark, and he created a count on every social media site I was on so that he can keep an eye on me. I felt like this was completely unnecessary, but it didn't matter how much I complained about it. He would just give me the same answer. There are certain rules you have to follow as a kid. When you get older, that's when the freedom will come. This was getting to be very irritating. I was suddenly 16 years old and I felt like I was being treated like a 10 year old. But just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, my dad says I have to stay with my crazy aunt, Vicky. Your ticket, sir, a voice said. I looked to my left and saw Mr. Hurston holding his hand out for my ticket, and Deborah standing next to him devouring a hamburger like a starving lion. I handed Mr. Hurston my ticket, while looking at Deborah, surprised at her table manners. Are you not feeding her? I asked Mr. Hurston. It's not like that. Deborah just decided to spend all of her money I gave her on clothes. So while everybody else was enjoying meals at the food court, she went hungry. Hey, you're a guy, Deborah protested between a bite of her burger. You don't understand how crucial it is to buy the latest outfits on day one. It isn't worth starving over, I commented. Is the vessel charged? Matt asked. It should be fully charged by tomorrow morning, Mr. Hurston answered. Since you aren't staying with us tonight, are you going on the trip? Mr. Hurston asked. Of course I am, I happily confirmed. Just remember, you will only be able to go forward into the future, but never back to the past. Interesting, I said, playing along. I knew this was some kind of simulator, or they were going to give us a tour of various sites in Louisville that were currently under construction. There is no way anyone could travel tens of thousands of years into the future. It was impossible. However, even if this was some cheesy ride, these people were cool and I wanted to spend some time with them over the summer. I heard a knock at the front door. I figured it was just more members coming, but when they knocked a second time, I heard, Police, open up. I turned to look at the door, concerned with why the cops would be here. Deborah put her plate on a nearby chair and ran over to the front door and answered it. She greeted the two officers at the door, and she seemed like she was a little afraid when she was speaking with them, but I quickly realized what they were here for. Is there a Sam Green here with us? Deborah asked everyone. My heart sank. My name is Sam Green. I looked at my phone and fear shot through me when I saw that I had 30 missed calls. They were all from Aunt Vicky and Dad, and the time was 8.45. I was in big trouble, and I knew there was about to be some serious consequences. I got up and walked over to Deborah and the police. I told them my name and asked them what was going on, even though I clearly knew the answer to that. Your aunt is worried sick, one of the officers snapped. The way she was acting, it was only a matter of time before she started a search party for your ass. I bowed my head. You'd better come with us, his partner said. I said goodbye to Deborah, Matt, and Mr. Hurston. I then walked out of the townhouse, and with the two officers, I got in the back seat of a police cruiser. I pulled out my 3DS and started playing it on the drive home, so the fear wouldn't bother me as much. I knew that Aunt Vicky was scared and I knew she was also angry. All of that was going to be mixed with alcohol. 
So I had to value this moment because these could be the last few minutes I have in this world because I was on my way home to a drunken lunatic. When I got back to Aunt Vicky's house, the police walked me in the front door and I rang the doorbell. In a matter of seconds, Aunt Vicky came to the door in her nightgown. Her eyes were bloodshot red and I could smell the booze radiating off of her. We found him at some kind of party, said one of the officers. Aunt Vicky's face darkened. Get inside, she demanded. I walked inside the house and she thanked the two officers for finding me and closed the door. I turned to walk away from her, but I felt something hit the back of my head. I bent over in pain and turned to see her clutching a Bible in both hands. What was that for? You stupid son of a bitch, Aunt Vicky yelled. I told you to be home by six. My dad told you not to hit me, I reminded her. This is my house and I can do whatever I want, she remarked hastily. Your dad was worried sick. He opted to fly all the way down here to look for your stupid ass. We called you I don't know how many times. What were you doing that you couldn't answer the phone? I was at the movies earlier and I forgot to take my phone off silent. I explained. That's no excuse, Aunt Vicky snapped. Out of rage, she chucked her Bible at me, but I ducked and it hit the $600 picture of Jesus on the cross behind me. It fell off the wall and the frame broke, causing the picture to come out of it. Damn you, Sam, she cursed. Damn you to hell, you heathen. Aunt Vicky let out a loud, ear-wrenching scream as she started taking her various Bibles off their shelves and throwing them around the room, even ripping the pages out of some of them. I figured she was just blindly blowing off steam without realizing she was destroying her valuables. I got scared when she came running at me, roaring like a hungry tiger. She pushed me against the wall, and I dropped my 3DS. She saw this, and she grabbed it, and with all of her strength, she threw it through the living room window, and the glass shattered all over the carpet. I ran out of the living room and into my bedroom. Then I pulled out my phone and called my dad. His phone rang once, twice, thrice, four times, but no answer. I tried a second time, and he answered on the first ring. Sam, he said. Thank God your dad, Aunt Vicky, is having another episode, I said frantically. What? Dad, she's going crazy. How do I stop this? I demanded. Before I could respond, my bedroom door was kicked open, and to my horror, I saw a furiously drunk Aunt Vicky aiming a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun directly at me. I dropped my phone and everything seemed to go in slow motion. I heard the sound of her pumping the gun. I dove out of the way seconds before I saw the brief flash, followed by the explosion of the weapon going off. The sound of the gun was like a cannon going off. My ears started ringing heavily. I swear I nearly lost my hearing at that moment. However, even though sharp ringing and the intense pain from my ears, I could still hear my father screaming hysterically for me to say something to him on the phone. I looked at Aunt Vicky and saw she was pumping her weapon for another shot. I got up and ran out of the room. A chunk of doorway was blown off when she fired at me but missed. I ran down the hallway at speeds only fear and adrenaline can give you at a deadly moment like this. I burst out of the front door, nearly breaking it off its hinges. Then I ran across the front yard and down the street. I looked behind me and saw Aunt Vicky. She was chasing me and struggling to keep up. I was in range of gunfire and I was sure the next shot would hit me. I saw her pump her weapon again and a shell came out of the gun. I braced myself, knowing that in a few seconds, I would be turned to Swiss cheese. I turned around, not waiting to see her firing the fatal shot, but the gun jammed. I heard the amazing sound of the trigger clicking as she tried to fire over and over again. I kept running down the street until I was out of the neighborhood. I stopped running to catch my breath, and I vomited what I had to eat at the meeting onto the pavement. I didn't even realize I pushed myself this hard till it was all over. After all of the food from the meeting was on the pavement, I looked up and saw a city bus in front of me. The driver opened the door, offering me a ride. 
I got on and paid the fare. As I went to take my seat, she said, don't get sick on my bus. I sat down at the seat, exhausted and scared. I didn't have a clue what to do. I had nowhere to sleep and my aunt was out to kill me. I knew all she had to do was call the cops and say I ran away and they would bring me right back to her. I knew they wouldn't believe me when I told them she had shot at me. I knew that they would just write it off as lies of a rebellious teenager. Dad wasn't going to call off his honeymoon that he was paying thousands of dollars for, so the only place left for me to go was on this trip to the future. The bus took me close to the heart of downtown. I was at a McDonald's on 2nd Street, right across the street from Hotel Louisville. I got off the bus knowing I was nowhere near where I was supposed to be. I couldn't remember where the house was, but I knew it was across the street from Central Park. So I put that place into a GPS and started walking. When I got close to Central Park, I began looking around for the house. However, it didn't take long for me to find it because I noticed a line of cars parked along the opposite side of the street from me. More people had shown up for the all-night event. I crossed the street and made my way to the house and knocked on the door. Deborah answered the door, surprised to see me after what happened earlier. Hi, Sam. What are you doing here? She greeted. I thought you'd had to go home because of your aunt. I talked to her and everything turned out okay. I lied. So she's not still mad? Oh no, everything's all right. After we talked, she let me come back. Well, in that case, come on in, she invited. You're just in time for Back to the Future, too. I walked inside and saw a lot more people than earlier. Some were huddled up in blankets and others had brought sleeping bags. I just grabbed the first spot I saw and sat down to watch the movie. A few seconds later, I was tapped on the shoulder. I looked behind me and saw Deborah signaling for me to follow her. I got up and followed her back to her spot. A burgundy blanket was laid out on the floor and a fresh bag of popcorn lay on it. We both sat down and shared the bag of popcorn together as we enjoyed the movie. Throughout the night, we enjoyed a marathon of various science fiction films. At about 3.30 a.m., I dozed off during the movie Alien. When I woke up, I was surprised to see that everyone was packing their things and putting them on a bus. It's almost time to leave, Deborah told me. I gave her a sheepish look. Already? I said. Yeah, Mr. Hurston wants to be out of here by noon, and that later than normal. What about breakfast? I asked. We will eat when we get there, she answered. Now get on the bus. I'll meet you there. The bus was your typical traveling bus, similar to a Greyhound bus. When I got on, I took a seat in the front of the bus next to the window. The bus was almost filled with passengers, and everyone seemed anxious to get going. I waited at my seat for about 15 more minutes as more people were packing their things into the bus. A few people forgot some of their things inside. When it was time to go, Deborah took the seat next to me, and Mr. Hurston got in the driver's seat and started the bus. All right, guys and gals, the trip to the future is about to begin. Please fasten your seatbelts and remain in your seats till the bus comes to a stop. If you break any of these rules, you will surely fall flat on your ass. A few people laughed at that last statement. Other than that, sit back, relax, and enjoy your trip to the future. Have a good day. The engine roared when he put the bus in gear. He then pulled out in front of the town home and began speeding down the street. The bus gained more and more speed as we raced through morning traffic. Cars and trucks blew their horn as we flew past them at high speed. The passengers were screaming in absolute fear, begging Mr. Hurston to slow down, but he ignored them. My blood ran cold when I saw a building in the distance that we were headed straight for. There was no way this man was going to stop in time for us not to crash into it. That was when I knew we were all dead. I gripped Deborah's hand, shut my eyes as tight as humanly possible. Open your eyes, Sam, Deborah laughed. I opened my eyes and my mouth to scream at her when I noticed outside of the window across from me, everything was dark. It looked as though we were in outer space, traveling at light speed. About a minute later, I saw daylight, and then the bus began to slow down. I breathed a sigh of relief when the bus came to a stop. All right, 
Here we are, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Hurston said. June 14th, 2066. So quoth this raven.